Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining this discussion on cow politics in India. You may all have heard that amid widespread criticism, the Animal Welfare Board of India on Friday said it has withdrawn the appeal to celebrate February 14th as Cow Hug Day, following directions from the government. This is a good step. The politics of cow has deep roots in India, and it often leads to absurdity and violence. The cow politics is not limited to worshipping cows. Some cow radicals celebrate cow urine and even its dung as medicine or even as a vaccine. Cow urine is sold in many Ayurvedic outlets in India today. It is even believed as an all-cure medicine to drink. In this changed context, Sanil Edamarku will speak today on cow politics in India. Thank you all for joining once again. We'll be taking your questions at the end of the discussion and we will continue having a discussion on this. Thank you so much. The news that came a couple of days back announcing by the Animal Husbandry Department or Society or part of Government of India the exact term that it used is that very simple. It was advising people. It's not an order, but people may celebrate 14th of February as a cow hug day. That is the, the primary position it has taken. But why it should be celebrated? And the animal welfare department should be concerned about the animals should be concerned about the health of animals, concerned about the well-being of the animals and their protection and all these kinds of things, which one can understand. But the argument that the Animal Welfare Department made was very simple. It said, it's a new celebration of India's traditions will take place. So Animal Husbandry Department is going out of the way to keep India's traditions and it is engaging in a new area of activity which was not defined in their activities as per the statutory position it has and decided to go and protect Indian traditions as it understands what is Indian tradition. Also, quote, it says, Vedic traditions are almost on the verge of extinction due to the progress of Western culture. The appeal says. So again, quote, the dazzle of Western civilization has made our physical culture and heritage almost forgotten. What an interesting responsibility the Animal Husbandry Department has taken up now because it, the Animal Husbandry Department is worried about the extinction of the Vedic traditions in India. It prejudices itself to reinstate the Vedic traditions by protecting animals. And what was the problem with the, the extinction of the Vedic traditions? As per the Animal Welfare Department, it says that it is a dazzle of Western civilization. And that has made a damage of, of our physical culture and heritage. Our heritage is almost forgotten. And as you all know, it's not only in Hinduism, but many other Indian religions, including Sikhism, Jainism, and Buddhism, rever cow as an important animal. For many Hindus, cow is a holy animal. Understandable. It's part of their belief. And when, when did exactly the idea of uh, considering cow as a sacred animal or considering cow as an animal to be worshipped came into being. Was it part of the Vedic tradition? That was the first question that one would ask when one hears about this, the very strong statement that the Animal Husbandry Department has made about its major concern. Well, the Vedic tradition speak a different thing altogether. You all know that Vedas, as we understand, are taken into two major parts. One is the Vedanga, which is not the major text of Vedas, 
but the other parts of vedas i mean the interpretation of vedas the upanishads and other for example the brahmanas and all these kind of i mean later literature are also taken as part of vedas by some people but what is exactly vedas vedas for example one of the major exponents of the vedas in the modern times in the 18th century was swami dayananda saraswati founder of arya samaj he very clearly insisted that the vedas means the samhita of vedas samhita is means the original text of vedas the fundamental vedas rigveda yajurveda samaveda and atharva veda for many people atharva veda is not part of the veda samhita because it has a different structure than the first three vedas i'll come to that i mean but the most important thing is do the veda samhita the four texts whether the vedas speak about protection of cow or worshiping cows or considering cow as a holy animal if one goes through the text of vedas we don't see anything of that sort of course i mean you can see in the in the 10th chapter of uh, uh, rigveda a position that the cows are avatya it's cannot be killed but why those cows that are milking should not be killed there is a mentioning in the 10th chapter of rigveda but whether the 10th chapter or dasama skanda as they would say is part of real original text of rigveda is very much disputed by a lot of vedic scholars themselves why because in the 10th chapter of rigveda there are several sacrifices are mentioned including purusha metha yaga which is human sacrifice when that is mentioned by critics it's always quoted that the 10th chapter is an interpolation it was not in the original text of rigveda okay this was the only part of it but on the other side if you go into the text of vedas you see how animals are to be sacrificed how cows are killed in the process of the sacrifice and in the heaven and how for example the the most favorite dish of the devas which is known as vapa was extracted from the sacrificial animal this is all narrated in the vedic text i mean one of the most shocking thing about the vedic sacrifice is that the animals were not just killed but they were killed in a special way so that the so called vapa which the gods are or or the devas were interested was extracted they would close all the holes that the animal has navadwaras both the nose both the ears both the eyes the mouth and the rectum as well as the urinary tract so all the nine holes that it can have any other i mean release from the body are closed of course skin is not closed then the animal is actually suffocating and dying it was believed that when an animal is killed like that a special kind of fat will be formed at the near the neck of the animal which is known as vapa and that was what the devas always liked and why these sacrifices were done it was done because the people who were making these sacrifices or the making all these prayers and hymns and other requests they wanted victory over their enemies they wanted more somarasa they wanted good children so everything that the people of those times wanted they tried to get by satisfying the wishes of the devas or satisfying the, the 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 devas by providing them the most desirous thing so this is put in the fire the sacrificial fire and the smoke is going up and devas would be satisfied but also you can see that the, the cow which was sacrificed would be distributed among the major priests the purohitas what part will go to hota what part will go to the other priest everything was very clearly defined in the vedic text 
most people do not know it why i speak about that is because i mean for a special reason that i have studied about vedas and i have written a book about vedas in my mother tongue malayalam and i had an opportunity to go into the details of the vedas in the original form trans, uh, in sanskrit as well as the translations in english as well as the original translations in other languages including my mother tongue i have exposed to sanskrit language i mean from my childhood therefore i had a primary possibility to check what i was reading whether it was correct or not though the sanskrit that is used in vedas are not the proper sanskrit that we use at this moment it's an ancient form of sanskrit but interpretations are abundantly available anybody can check so having said that the most interesting thing that one notices is that in modern times who was the first political leader or first religious leader who spoke against cow slaughter or projected cow as a symbol of hindu faith or vedic faith that was dayananda saraswati himself also one has to understand that dayananda saraswati i mean a very great scholar of uh, not only vedas but also other hindu texts he lived in uh, in 1800s and tried to modernize the hindu way of life criticized a lot of things in the hindu tradition including the caste system he did not approve the present day caste system he encouraged mixed marriages also he insisted that one would become a brahmin not by birth but by karma but he insisted that karma is not connected with reincarnation because he did not believe in reincarnation he insisted that there is no mentioning about reincarnation in the vedic texts the belief in reincarnation came after that he insisted on the importance and the primacy of uh, the vedic texts the samhita the original text of rigveda yajurveda samaveda and atharvaveda so all other parts i mean what we speak as upanishads we know with uh, 101 upanishads or 10 upanishads as some other people would say or i mean several hundreds of upanishads as many would many people would say were, were not taken as part of vedas by dhyananda saraswati most serious exponent of the vedic culture in modern times so he said the karma is the what we do in this life and if you become a scholar of vedas if you become a scholar of sanskrit language and if you follow the the basic traditions and rituals that the vedic practices insist you would become a brahmin and anyone can become a brahmin he said which the traditional hindus did not like at that time the sanatani tradition there are two major traditions of hinduism in those times i mean one can say the kind of uh, focusing that dayananda saraswati tried to give at that time on the vedic texts or the samhita and his interpretation of vedas that rejected idol worship for example he did not approve these temples he said temples and idolatry are not part of the vedic belief or hindu belief that was dayananda saraswati and he had a huge following in uttar pradesh madhya pradesh haryana and and rajasthan i mean that's the area where he was very popular he has uh, written a series of questions and answers i mean that was the way of communication that he tried to use and uh, this was consolidated as one book which is known as satyartha prakash available now in english translation as well as in hindi and it's available online also i i welcome you all when you get time to download satyartha prakash and uh, understand how the idea of uh, the vedic culture by denouncing idolatry by denouncing the worship in temples by by denouncing the offering to gods by denouncing most of the rituals that hindus would do now but insisting on the vedic supremacy that was what dayananda saraswati was insisting so he said caste system is not correct you can marry anybody if both the people are interested in it and he made a lot of arya samaj mandirs which are temples and wherein if two people go there and say that we want to marry your caste is never asked 
you have to become a member of Irish Samaj only, then you can marry. Even now, in Northern India, if two people belonging to two different castes, one considered lower or one considered upper, and if you want to marry, you can go to an Irish Samaj Mandir and they will perform that ritual if you take the oath that you follow the ideals of Irish Samaj. So it's a very un unconventional form of Hinduism, but attracted a lot of people. And everywhere, the Ari Samajis opposed Hindus going to temples because idolatry is not part of Hinduism, according to them. So there was a counter argument from the Sanatani uh, tradition, but that's another thing. But why Dayananda Saraswati is important, it was he who insisted on the prominence of cow in Indian politics, first in the modern times. And his influence was very deep. Imagine this time, 1800s, before the first rebellion in India against the British authority, which was in 1857. The major rallying point, if you remember the, the, the basics of uh, the historic time that we had at that time, was not nationalism, but a nationalism built on the basis of kind of faith. The soldiers in the British army, Indians, were mainly Hindus and Muslims. The Indian independence struggle, the first Indian independence struggle, which was the rebellion in the army, which is called by the Britishers as the Sepoy Mutiny, and we call it as the first Indian independence struggle, was campaigning on one point. The leaders of the struggle told the Hindus that the cartridges that the new guns that they have was waxed by cow's fat. And to the Muslims, they said that it is with pig fat. Both worked very well. And so both this set of people, the, the British Indian army, comprising of Hindus and Muslims, with their traditional faith that uh, pig is haram for Muslims and cow is holy for Hindus, which became a very, very popular idea because of the Ananda Saraswati. The, the rallying point was very successful. Understanding it very well, after the defeat of the 1957 rebellion, that was the East India Company at that time. There was no British Empire at that time. East India Company was ruling all these small kingdoms and making up their structures, which was dismantled the authority was taken over by the British government and the East India Company was nationalized in 1857 after the rebellion. And the capital of India was established in Calcutta. Now, what happened after that is history. Most of us know about Indian history was the Britishers were carefully using a strategy of divide and rule. The colonial rule everywhere was using this pattern of divide and rule. And the conflict that they tried to see ahead was something connected with the faith that was used during the independence struggle. The Muslims found their interest in the, uh, the first independence struggle because of the, the pig fat, which was alleged at that time, which was used in the cartridge. And on the other side, Hindus were told it was cow's fat. Whether it was correct or not is still not known, but uh, that was the rallying point. But this joining together of these two set of people can simply be dismantled if there is a conflict between the Hindus and Muslims in India. So the conflict was built upon one point that was based on people who eat cow and people who worship cow. And to identify who were the untouchables in, in India, Britishers found a very interesting argument. Those people who eat cow were considered the untouchables. And those people who would consider cow as holy were caste Hindus. That was very clearly established in some of the early documents of the British tradition. So uh, the, the conflict was set. The future conflict that would happen in the Indian subcontinent 
that is very clearly a communal conflict between the Hindus and Muslims that would divide the Indian subcontinent emotionally and with all practical sense of it, a communal division started triggering after the failure of the, or after the rebellion of 1857. So this was the situation because these people who actually went for glorifying cow was taking a clue deliberately handed to them by the British authorities to divide India. And that worked very well. Later, we see a lot of conflict between Hindus and Muslims based on this point. Those people who ate cow were attacked. Or if cow was not reversed, that was a point of conflict. There were a lot of conflicts between Hindus and Muslims based on the their idea about cow. For some people, cow was an edible meat. For some other people, it's a holy animal. New theories were presented and how cow is a symbol of uh, the universal power. And I mean, a lot of different ideas were presented. And I mean, it became a part of the, the Indian tradition. Well, was cow a serious issue before that? Before Dayananda Saraswati picked it up? You can see that a small sect of people worshipped cow all throughout. One can see even the Mughal period, I mean, cow worship was uh, practiced and there are earlier mentionings also about cow worship. But for the other people who would eat cow, it was not taken as a serious offense at that time. For those people who understood cow as part of their faith system, they went with it, but it was never a major point of conflict before that. But an interesting question comes here. Why when people used to sacrifice cows earlier, used to eat cows earlier, which is documented in early literature, turned into, I mean, the Hindus, most of the Hindus were not eating cow later. They turned more and more to vegetarianism. In second century, third century records show that many Indians were vegetarians already. But Vedic traditions, which is much earlier than that, was a different thing. People ate animals, sacrificed animals, killed animals, and that was part of the, the whole package. One of the explanations that experts give is as follows. In the early Vedic stage, agriculture was not fully developed. Later Vedic period, you see agriculture getting established and grains could be stored. One major challenge that people found in the animal sacrifice is the demand to kill more and more animals. If you go to the later lit literature after the Vedic Samhita, the later, later literature of Hindus or Vedic culture or Brahminic culture speaks about special wishes that Brahmins had. For example, if you do a certain sin or a certain mistake, you can compensate it with giving cows to Brahmins. The number of cows that are sacrificed were growing and growing. Apparently, to an agricultural economy that was coming up, with cow as the major, uh, I mean, plowing animal, and the development of dairy, milk and butter and yogurt, one understands that the major food supply or staple food can be safer and easier with two sources. One, the grains that they cultivated and second, the dairy products that they had. People used to drink milk or they used to make butter even during the Vedic times. A cow that is, milking should not be killed, but other animals are easily killed. Even in Ashwamedha Yaga, even uh, a horse is the sacrificial animal. It's killed and it's explained how to kill it. And before killing, what all rituals are to be practiced, everything is narrated so clearly in the Vedic text. And many people who speak about the protection of cows and uh, the, the holiness of the cows, 
do not go into the text of Vedas. That is why they speak that it is from the Vedic times. In fact, the Vedic times where they, they were killing animals, they were killing animals for sacrifice, they were eating it. Meat was abundantly used by most of the people at the time. But the number of sacrifices, the number of killing of animals, eventually reduced the number of the animals. And apparently there was a need to have food security. And food security demanded that these animals should be protected at one side and people should move to more sustainable food, which are grains and the other agricultural products, as well as the dairy products. This perhaps started during the second century or just before that, but eventually one sees the reduction of killing of animals and the idea that people should be vegetarian and food storage also developed around this time. Warehousing, which was one of the major problems of earlier Indian food supply, was also developing with the, when people started studying using grains. So eventually, more and more I mean, dependence on vegetarian diet or plant-based diets become popular, but it gets a setback mainly after the, the Sultanate, for example, the Muslims come to India and they become political authority and they were traditionally not only eating meat, but also animals were sacrificed during the Creed, which was very, very clear. So people coexisted. Some people ate meat, some people did not eat meat, but certainly only the caste Hindus followed the idea because they were only considered real citizens. The other animals were eaten. The dead animals were eaten by the untouchables. They were allowed to take it away and skin it, eat it also. So many of them ate also. But if you look at the tradition that is explained in, the, uh, in Mahabharata, for example, or Ramayana, the great epics of India, which are not only literature, but also taken as a religious text by some people, speaks about, about kings who go for hunting. Hunting is taken as a profession. Meat was served and most of the people hunt for food. And hunting was a very respected uh, I mean, position that the people from the royalty would be doing. Others also were hunting. So which means, I don't think Mahabharata or Ramayana were historical or anything, or there could be some traces of uh, some ideas which could be coming from different sources. But always I try to see these epics as symbols of the way of life, symbols of the attitudes and views expressed in different ways of literature. And that gives a reflection and it's a mirror of the thoughts of the people when this was written. So it's very clearly Vedas also are like that. I mean, Vedas are not, I don't think there is any reverence that is required for Vedas, but it's serious literature. And one can understand the way of life, attitude and the lifestyles of those periods and their value system and everything is understood. And these are therefore traces of history. The same thing is with the Ramayana also or Mahabharata also. You see hunting kings, people eating meat, celebrating meat, everything we can see there. So vegetarianism is not part of the whole culture, but a set of people slowly leave uh, meat production because of two reasons. The lack of the availability of meat, number one, it becomes less and less sustainable, number two. And thirdly, there was an abundant supply of grains and vegetables and other food, as including dairy food, which is not that complicated to obtain, which became easy. People started settling down. So this probably made the huge shift. In any case, we see a prominence of the idea of the Vedic culture and cow worship coming as part of Dayananda Saraswati's movement. But it also has another side. As you all know, Dayananda Saraswati's campaign, 18th century, was also focusing on another thing, against conversion to Islam. He tried to reconvert all the Muslims to Hindu fold. So a major question 
at that time came was where would you convert back to because hinduism was not co- called hinduism at that time and it was he called it the vedic religion it it had castes only people were not in one religion but in different castes which caste you would convert to so he said anybody can be converted to brahmanism provided they follow a certain level of basic education in sanskrit as well as vedas and he converted a lot of people from other castes of hindus to brahmanism or from other religions especially from muslims to brahmanism and he gave them the symbol of holy thread there was a huge dispute from which side the holy thread of hari samaj should be there and uh, finally a settlement was made that it should be from the other side not like the other brahmins so that they could be differentiated but he gave them he converted people to hinduism and gave them holy thread and made them brahmins and and started a process which slowly became anti muslim or in conflict with islam this is the point at one side the anand saraswati was a great contributor to indian civilization because he was the first modern leader who spoke against castes and he illegitimized the idea of the caste hierarchy and he said it's not coming from your birth but with your act that was a major step he promoted and accepted the idea of mixed marriage which did not exist peacefully from around 2nd century to 18th century it was very difficult except if you are in a very powerful political position you could not do that of course akbar emperor you can see that he has married a christian a jew and i mean he had four wives one christian one hindu one muslim third was parsi i don't, I don't know exactly there were four from four different religions but that was possible for an emperor not for the common man for the common man it was very difficult because of the conflicting situation so that is what the anand saraswati broke so therefore that's a there is a positive contribution but on the other side he insisted on the anti muslim spirit because he wanted all these muslims he considered that all those people who were in india all were all vedic people they all should come back to the fold of the vedic faith system this is where the point of conflict one could see but later we see another the second major contribution to the idea of worship of cows comes from india's father of nation gandhi also this idea gandhi on the other side unlike dayananda saraswati a century later gandhi did not insist on a conflict between the hindus and muslims but he tried to make a proximity between hindus and muslims a cordiality between hindus and muslims and he wanted to win both muslims and hindus in the independence struggle there's a huge difference in the approach of dayananda saraswati and in the approach of gandhi the two major exponents of worshiping cow or seeing cow as a holy animal one in 18th century dayananda saraswati and in 19th century gandhi gandhi if you all know i mean very very clearly gandhi found he was a caste hindu in the early part of his life he believed that varnashrama dharma which is the the caste or or the the varna division in the vedic structure kshatriyas brahmins vaishyas and shudras and the rest of them as untouchable people the panjamas he thought that this was a divine order and that has to be followed but as politically he wanted to win the local kings in in different parts of india who would insist on this also the british has divided the indian kingdoms which were uh, princely states into two categories the hindu ruled ones and the muslim ruled ones and he wanted to make kind of a winning the people despite their religion and the first major effort of gandhi we can see was in 2019 the first world war during that time before that also gandhi started projecting cow continued the, the the heritage of dayananda saraswati except the anti muslim position he projected cow as a symbol of hinduism he worshiped cow and he respected cow and he he was even afraid to drink cow's milk it's a sin against cow he thought i mean that's for the calf you remember the famous story that when he was invited to britain for a discussion he was not sure whether he would get 
a milk which is not from cow he took a goat along with him goat he didn't find very holy the milk of goat was okay for him he had a preferential treatment to cows as against goats in any case gandhi insisted on the holiness of cow and gandhi said at very clear positions he insisted on the holiness of cow and he i wanted to identify cow as a symbol of india's heritage so that's the point he thought he would win the hindus on his side on the other side that's what i was trying to say that in in the, on the first world war there was a political development happening during the first world war you have to also remember that uh, 1857 the east india company was nationalized the british started directly ruling india and almost something like 60 70 years later the first world war comes and during the first world war britain was against turkey against turkey as part of the they were in opposite camps and turkey at that time was not the present day turkey that was the headquarters of ottoman empire those times islam had an international headquarters like rome once upon a time for the catholics the sultan of uh, turkey or ottoman empire was the the khalifa of all muslims all around the world at that time the ottoman empire spread all across europe and to a part major part of the present day western asia then britain attacks the ottoman empire they collapsing the political authority of ottoman empire and dismember the authority of the ottoman empire many of the small kingdoms many of the many parts of the ottoman empire was collapsed they were independent and most of the present day west asian countries emerged at that time and ottoman empire was completely getting shattered so that time gandhi joined a movement named the khilafat movement and what is khilafat movement is very clear the khalifa of all muslims the sultan the the supreme authority of all muslims was the the sultan of uh, turkey and britain is against him so to protect the sultanate of turkey sultanate of ottoman empire all muslims all around the world should join together and fight against the britishers that was the khilafat movement quite irrelevant to in indian context but gandhi wanted this to be taken as a part of india's independence struggle congress party for him should be the carrier of the khilafat movement this position was aimed at winning the muslims on one side he was promoting worship of cows and promoting the idea that cow is a holy animal and winning the hindus at one side and taking bhagavad gita in his hand and on the other side he wanted to win the muslims especially the political muslim who were at one side collaborating with the britishers and a kind of alternative muslim focused nationalism was building up and he wanted to win that to the mainstream indian independence struggle so khilafat movement was initiated you know who were the people who opposed the khilafat movement would show what kind of an absurd idea gandhi was making at that time i respect gandhi to a great extent and his contribution in the later part of india's independence struggle needs to be appreciated to a great extent but he made a lot of mistakes in his past and one major mistake that he did was very clearly supporting the khilafat movement and bringing it part of the international congress and national independence struggle when this was brought in the national congress annual conference the people who opposed that were the secular camp in the indian national congress that was led at that time by later the father of pakistan the, the reason that pakistan was made muhammad ali jinnah was the leader of indian national congress at that time and he was a secularist those times and he opposed this move and when he opposed gandhi's ideas of khilafat movement becoming part of india's independence struggle jinnah opposed and he was howled down by the audience because they were completely overwhelmed by gandhi's image jinnah left and in a later leaves he goes to london and he was unhappy and he was a very powerful leader in the international congress 
He leaves politics and lives in London. And the, the leader of the secular ideals in Indian politics later was convinced by some people to become the proponent of a, a Muslim homeland. History is irony, and he becomes the father of nation of Pakistan, a country made on the basis of religion. That's part of history. In any case, the Khilafat movement, one side was uh, taken by Gandhi. The other person who opposed also is to be noted. That was Annie Besant. Annie Besant is a well-known person, born to British parents, and lived a major part of her life in, in the UK. Annie Besant was a close associate of Charles Bratla, the, the legendary British parliamentarian who was instrumental in making a law there where one can take oath without the mentioning of, the, of God by solemnly affirm you can be a parliament member now in Britain, later in almost all the colonies of former colonies of Britain. That was because of Charles Bratla, because he was elected into the British Parliament and he was asked to take an oath in the name of God. He insisted that he would not because he does not, he did not believe in a God. And he was not allowed to take oath. But eventually, he loses parliament membership and then there was a re polling and he was elected again. So it repeats, I mean, four or five times it, re it repeated and every time he lost parliament membership because he refused to take oath in the name of God. And finally, the laws were changed for him. And in Britain, it was possible now from Charles Pratt last time that one can take oath with the solemn affirmation without mentioning of any God. And Annie Besant was the collaborator of Charles Pratla, the friend of Charles Pratla. Many others write that she was the lover of Charles Pratla, associating with him and the woman behind this man. That was Annie Besant. And then she comes over to India and becomes the president of Indian National Congress years before Gandhi became a president of Indian National Congress. And she, why this background was important, because she was one person who strongly opposed Gandhi's idea of the Khilafat movement becoming part of India's independent struggle. She opposed. And she later abstained from the India's independent struggle and started the Theosophical movement. That's all part of history. Gandhi made serious mistakes on many things, including the promoting coercion and uh, promoting religion, bringing religion into Indian politics, or winning religion from all sides, or appeasing religion on all sides, was a pattern that was begun by Gandhi and taken forward by him. And later, India paid a big price for that. That doesn't, I, I mean, that, I, I don't want to reduce the importance of Gandhi in student of political science, especially I know what kind of a politician Gandhi was and what kind of willpower he had and then what kind of influence he had on Indian psyche and Indian people to take them forward for, to a position that they would leave everything, including their jobs and everything behind and stand for India's independence. That was Gandhi in his early st structures. But this cow as a prominent image in India's psyche was partly Gandhi's contribution also. Two major people, Dhyananda Saraswati and Gandhi. But when India was independent, some of the Hindus, especially who were under the influence of Dhyananda Saraswati and the, the cow vigilants, who were also very active at that time, they suggested that modern India's constitution should very clearly stop slaughtering of cow or eating cow. So cow, I mean, it should be totally banned. That was the idea. So many people in the Constituent Assembly of India asked for it, demanded for it, and argued for it. And most of the things which were very disputable amongst the members of the Constituent Assembly, one of the easiest way that the Constituent Assembly found was putting them into the directive principles. So, cow slaughter should be totally banned, was put in the directive principle, as along with the uniform civil court, because Britishers made a kind of civil court 
all, all the civil laws are the same for everybody except for two three things number one how you should marry how you should divorce how you how, how should be your inheritance all these three four things are different for different religions that is the way the britishers had it and they call it the, the personal laws of each religion and that was to be changed and there should be one civil law as in other matters on marriage divorce inheritance also and that was disputed at that time because the hindus mainly opposed that the hindu wing of the international congress especially sada vallabhai patel and rajendra prasad were or not very happy with it so it was stopped it was put into the directive principles so coming back to cow cow became a part of india's tradition a lot of people worship cow but that was not part of the mainstream hinduism that is something very important if you go to northern india you ask anybody who was living from those times india's independence people know that many people worship cow some people think that if you feed cow that is rewarding cow is a mother for many people i mean hindu the emerging hinduism has many symbols connected with their faith for example the monkeys are not taken like just an animal for many people they are part of the army of uh, ram which has won the war against ravana for for example uh, many people would happily give food to monkeys i mean feeding any animal is a good thing but uh, the kind of reverence that many people have about cows uh, is also reflected in their reverence to monkeys for example some people you, i mean rajasthan for example there is a temple for rats because a rat is the vehicle of ganesh another deity of hindu pantheon so if you connect the hindu pantheon and all these gods of different traditions you can connect with almost all animals for example a, an eagle is where vishnu would be traveling or a bull can be the vehicle of shiva or serpents can be as uh, ornaments on shiva's head i mean you can connect all these animals and all because of their faith patterns but apart from that cow becomes more and more important for a small section of people and which is now seen as something not only part of your faith but also against some other people that comes mainly after the big communal conflict that india had during the independence struggle i mean especially at the time of independence india and pakistan were to be divided and people who wanted a muslim homeland left the main india and went for pakistan and people who wanted a, a position which is away from a, a muslim predominant country they came to india but not only they were shifting a huge shift of population to both sides with millions of people displaced and maybe a million people killed in the process because there was a communal conflict hindus and sikhs at one side they killed the muslims and the muslims killed the hindus and there was slaughtering of people everywhere in northern india huge wound in the indian psyche which is carried forward many people continue and carry forward this collective memory of past conflict and indian nationalism or indian indianness can only survive when we forget about this wounded past and the bleeding of the past and come as one nation but on the other side this issue of conflict with muslims which is there in the psyche of a lot of people is symbolized in cow that's a very interesting point because many muslim the cow slot the, the butchers mainly are hindus that's a profession mainly uh, taken by muslims in northern india and the skinning of cow was done mainly by certain dalit communities untouchable communities so those people they were i mean there were a lot of people who eat meat but also the the kind of position against muslims was focused on one point these are the people who eat our mother cow that was a rallying point on the other side it was revered it was presented as a holy animal that's to be respected and cow the lot of legends were built up around cow every legend that was created 
though looks humorous for other people made some kind of importance to those who said it for example cow's urine was considered a very valuable medicine for a lot of people i mean same belief like camel's urine was taken very valuable in a arabic tradition but this became very important and becomes more and more predominant and you can see i mean over the internet you search and i mean you can see many people directly trying to drink urine from the cow and consider that is very important or sprinkling cow's urine as a scent as for purification or cow's dung become another serious uh, of course cow's dung has an importance for two things number one as a bio fertilizer at one side on the other side in villages people are using dried cow dung as fuel but apart from that cow dung as something to be eaten or cow dung something that will protect you during corona's time i mean you can see i mean i mean majority of the hindus would do such things only a small section of people would go for such things but they are still there who would smear the whole body with the cow dung and cow urine and think that that would protect them some people a small section of people believes that but in every society such kind of absurdities exist addressing them at a public education level is something but when that becomes a point of violence or conflict to other people that becomes very dangerous or when politicians try to use this kind of deep rooted faith for achieving political ends there is something seriously wrong like gandhi has done earlier this was done i mean dayananda saraswati was not a political leader but he was a very predominant hindu leader or vedic leader but he focused on cow as against not only as a symbol of uh, though, though cows were eaten during vedic times he insisted on cow as a holy animal and pro- promoted cow as a symbol of the vedic tradition was also targeted against the muslims but later when gandhi wants to unite hindus and muslims also he takes khilafat movement at one side on the other side to balance he would go for powership later you see the uh, the indian tradition continues with that political parties have taken cow and calf as their symbol in elections congress party has done it once i mean of course it's a symbol only but it has a deep influence on the faith of people that's in a way deliberately done and you see when the emergence of hindu politics slowly in uh, 1990s especially after the national emergency which started which was in 1975 77 period when the, the janata party again was pitted and the, the bharatiya janata party came into existence and in many states they were winning several sections of hindus though it's not officially a hindu party officially it's just a party only which has a goal of a hindu rashtra or hindu cultural nation but it's very clear that they tried to win several interests of the hindu community depending on each area depending on each interest somewhere it could be the the ram temple some other places it could be the cow some other people it should be it could be anti muslim feeling i mean like any other political party i mean they have used all these political planks which could be consolidating the hindu identity okay but part of that what you have to see is how cow becomes important here is so to counter this there would have been one possibility to speak about the immorality of this argument or this position one could counter it on a secular plank but the congress party in many parts of india decided to counter it using the same strategy that a section of the hindu groups try to promote first time in modern history i mean cow slaughter was banned i mean in many parts of india but in many parts of india it's not banned also for example in west bengal it's not banned and i am coming from kerala i was born in kerala southern india in kerala for example uh, cow is eaten abundantly by all communities almost everybody hindus muslims christians everybody would eat it's a kind of a cosmopolitan society with Uh, nearly 48% or 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 50% hindus and uh, 
some 20-25% of Christians and Muslims and other, other groups. I mean, if you don't take the atheists, because atheists are spread in all, uh, from all religious backgrounds. But uh, uh, Northeastern India, people eat cow. But some states have found that, I mean, they, they have laws to stop cow slaughter. But interestingly, one state in India began a major campaign by a lawmaking against cow slaughter, mainly to counter the Hindu possibility or Hindu political possibility of using cow as a symbol of unifying the Hindu votes. That was known, but uh, when Digvijay Singh was chief minister in Madhya Pradesh, and who was Digvijay Singh? He was a leader of Congress party and that was a Congress government. Many people do not know that the, in modern India, the first major ban of cow slaughter and huge punishment for cow slaughter was established in Madhya Pradesh by a Congress chief minister, Digvijay Singh. It's unbelievable that Congress party would do such a thing for many people because it's now seen that it's a, it's a plank of BJP now. But in any case, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, this was first established. A section of the radical Hindus, I would like to place it not on one party, but a section of the radical Hindus found this as a point of harassing people or, or countering their so-called opponents and found this as a point of rallying. They say mainly radical Hindus. They belong to all, all political parties, not only BJP, but also of Congress, but also of other parties. Because all these parties who distance from this fundamental issue were pressed by these radical groups. The protection of cow became a rallying point for these groups. They demanded the ban of cow slaughter or eating cows and attacking those people who were suspected to be eating cows or taking cow carcasses. And this began, the first such story I remember was uh, in Haryana. I mean, that was in later uh, when Manmohan Singh was the prime minister, I think. I mean, I remember that because I was a journalist at that time in Delhi. And Haryana, the case was very simple. That was on a uh, Vijay Dasami day. Of, that was the celebration. The story of Ramayana, if you know, when Ram is winning over Ravana, that is supposed to be the day. And there was huge celebrations there. But one set of Dalits, the so-called untouchables, were carrying a dead body of a cow on a pickup van, which apparently was dead, and they were asked to take it away because they could skin it. And that was for their profession. They were interested in this job. But on the way, some people report that they, are, they have killed a cow and bringing the cow in a pickup van. And a group of the fanatic people Stop them. They found that there was a dead cow in the in the pickup van. No matter, they should. I mean, if they found that they have done something wrong, they should have reported it to police, and police should interfere. And even if I mean, I don't think that I mean, if uh, a cow is uh, killed, it should be a crime. But if it's a crime legally, that should be implemented by the law and order authority. But instead, the mad crowd attack these people who were in the van and kill them by skinning them alive and later burning them alive. It was a shocking, I mean, incident that happened. I've written articles about that those times and I have one of my books in Malayalam is about the holy cow and the dead cow. That was the name of the book. I mean, that is based on my reports at that time to some Malayalam journals at that time. So later, but imagine, at the time, Haryana state was run by Congress party and the central government was run by Congress party. Later, we have stories coming with the deeper consequences. I mean, you know the famous story that many people know, all, it was reported all around that in uh, Uttar Pradesh, a man was attacked at his home because there was an announcement in a temple that he was keeping cow's meat. And this person happened to be a Muslim. And this was announced in a temple and people attack him. And at the end of the day, he dies. And of course, some meat was located in his refrigerator. I mean, even if it was cow's meat, that was no reason to kill a person. 
if it was not allowed legally, and one can make a case against him, but instead he was beaten to death there. But the, the saddest thing is, it was later found after forensic examination that it was not even cow's meat, it was goat meat, though it doesn't make much of a difference in my view. But that is the kind of issues that was coming up in India. There were vigilant groups here and there. They would stop people if they were going with a cow and they would kill them, attack them. There were violence against them. There have been several dozens of cases in India. And especially when this was done by cow vigilante groups, it was easily cornered or pointed to the ruling BJP, which is focusing on, I mean, broadly Hindu politics, it's very clear. And this is a good point of attack on the Hindu politics. And of course, this becomes a big issue. And th this is to be addressed by the government of India. I found with the relief that the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, though I may not uh, accept many of his policies regarding the identity with the Hindu politics, but on this point, he made it very clear that he distanced himself with the cow vigilance. And he made it very clear that the government distances with these acts. And he said that this should be tackled by law and order methods. And that was a very good step. All the same, cow vigilantism is very active in India and it could win a section of the Hindu radicals. And these groups can influence the Hindu politics or make pressure on the Hindu political structures by focusing on cow or focusing on other things. And cow is one of the major things that the radical radical groups or right radical groups within the ruling structure could press the governing part of it to bring them to their position or insist on the right position that they would want. So cow becomes very important at this point. And it's always very clear that the cow radicals and the cow believers make absurd stories to win those cow lovers. What kind of stories? Very interesting. I mean, if you read the Indian newspapers, you can laugh a lot. Cows would protect you from radiation if there is an atomic warfare. So you can find plutonium in between the horns of the cows. There was a research in a university that gold can be separated from cow's urine and all those uh, you know, kind of absurd ideas at one side. You can see, for example, one of the most popular retail outlets that India has on Ayurvedic medicines run by Baba Ramdev sells cow urine bottled everywhere. And you can see pictures of people drinking cow's urine directly. I don't think that uh, majority of the Hindus follow these kind of things. I don't think even 10% of Hindus would follow these kind of things. But these people seriously believe it. These people seriously practice it and become laughing lot of other people. But also making some kind of pressure on the Hindu political plank, which the Congress wants to grab at one stage, and BJP has already grabbed. I mean, to a great extent. So this is the point where one enthusiast comes out with an idea that hugging a cow becomes an, a new way to bring back the Vedic culture. He doesn't know, I mean, honestly, anything about Vedic culture, number one. Number two, he doesn't know about Indian culture or he doesn't know about what he was speaking. Ignorance, absolute ignorance was very clearly seen in the first statement. And what was the purpose of this kind of a statement? I mean, as it is seen now, it's very clear that, I mean, this was an over-enthusiastic person. Probably he thought, I mean, how, how radicals could be convinced. Of course, even chief ministers would go and touch a cow and I mean, try to worship to win the cow vigilant groups. This guy apparently uh, found it interesting. But this became a matter of ridicule by everybody all around the world, practically. It was reported in uh, almost all countries about the special day they have taken to declare this cow hug day. Valentine's Day is something another set of Hindu radicals find 
very inconvenient. Some vigilant groups, for example, the, the Mangalore-based Sri Rab Sena, are totally against uh, Valentine's Day. They are against anybody publicly displaying their affection to each other. In Northern India, in many parts, even in parts of Delhi, I know, if a man and woman go hand in hand in a park, there can be an, an unexpected person coming in front of you and challenging you about your right to go together or sit together and talk. They think that that's against their culture. They wanted to protect their morality as they think what is morality by beating these people or attacking these people. You can see, just go over the internet and you can see young people going together and these, these uh, anti-love vigilants go with sticks and beating people. And these kind of people are also, this, this, you know, India is a complex tradition. It has a lot of different kind of people. And one part, India is a very modern country. That's the very important point. India is a very modern country. I mean, living in 21st century, thinking about artificial intelligence and, I mean, satellites and modern equipments and scientific advancement at one side. On the other side, India coexists with medieval times. We have 15th century and 16th century coexisting with 21st century. That's what India is. And India has to come out from these medieval times and it has to come to modern times. It has to come to terms with the modern day realities. We have to see that these people who still live in 15th century and 16th century and 17th century are to be taken forward. And for that, there is a big method that is already we have in Indian constitution. The promotion of scientific attitude, the spirit of inquiry, the spirit of humanism, the idea of reform. These are the promotion of spirit of inquiry and scientific attitude is part of the fundamental duties of all Indian citizens as per the constitution. What we lack is I mean, we start to teach people educate them with the scientific information or scientific knowledge, but scientific attitude is not conveyed to students. Curriculum has to change thoroughly in India. And we have to see that these people who are trapped in the medieval times, to, they are coming to the 21st century. This complicated structure in a very big country with different levels of cultural and uh, I mean scientific knowledge distribution, this conflict is imminent but it has to be addressed. That is why a government that is in power, any party should take these kind of things very seriously and address them very clearly so that the huge debate of their understanding level should not damage the progress that India makes on the other side. The debate is growing more and more. There are more and more superstitious people. Those people who are superstitious are going further on superstitions. And those people who are going modern, accepting modern way of understanding are also going further forward. Also, on the other side, parallelly, Indian society is in a transformation. As we all know, the Indian middle class is growing. The people who did not have buying power earlier, it's a, it's a ground reality. There's a huge shift from the poor people, the people did not have buying power, to the middle class. The number is you know, swelling very fast and the speed is enormous. And in, in these times of transformation, any society will have a tendency to be vulnerable to superstitious ideas, vulnerable to gurus. So that is the time when there should be a solution offered of knowledge, of scientific attitude, scientific temperament, and that should be inculcated, spirit of critical inquiry to be inculcated. That's the solution. If we do not do that, we will be entrapped into the ideas of past, of medieval times, and that will press Indian society into much more complications than we could imagine. So therefore, I am very glad that this you know, hasty act initiated by somebody to replace Valentine's Day with a cow hug ceremony or cow hug project was immediately withdrawn with huge public opinion emerging all around India. That's a good sign. Two ways it's a good sign, I would say. Number one, the public reacted so powerfully. The rationalists have taken this first and then it was all around and the whole media has taken it up. Social media became more powerful than the mainstream media and they have taken it forward and it has shifted to the mainstream media and televisions 
started discussing yesterday evening already and yesterday late evening they have withdrawn the statement and there's a big change in the whole thing a relief because it's that's one way of responding to these kind of over enthusiasm by vigilant people in the system the government has to be very clear about these kind of things i don't want i don't suggest that the government should be you know critical of religion or anything but they should not allow absurdities to prevail they should not allow the people who are intolerant to dominate they should not allow the pressure groups with the traditional ideas to supersede the mainstream modern society and there is no east and west now there is no south and north now the globe is becoming one and everybody is coming closer with the communication technology that we have and the distance between east and west and the distance between north and south is vanishing very fast if somebody comes and say that the western civilization is bad and he is communicating even that with the technology that he got from west every culture every single culture has to contribute something to the world and we all have contributed to the world it's not only western culture it's eastern culture it's it's culture from all sides when scientific inquiry came from all sides but what we mean by western culture if you mean is scientific attitude that is something not to be attacked scientific attitude and scientific way of living and the spirit of inquiry if you trace the origins of it from the greek tradition from aristotle well i mean that's nothing wrong india itself can take pride of its own heritage of critical inquiry starting from lokayatas and charvakas every culture has something that can be cherished in the spirit of critical inquiry and spirit of i mean questioning and that's to be cherished and that's to be taken forward and this victory that we got by getting this absurd i mean proposal by the animal husbandry department which was none of their business was a major victory and that shows that the collective effort of rationalists and free thinkers and atheists and all progressive people i don't want it to be categorized with a atheist rationalist issue only it's an issue of all progressive minded people in india that we have to guard this great civilization not going into the medieval times and perishing there like every other societies indian society also should go forward it has a great potential and it should be taken forward with modern knowledge scientific experiences and scientific attitude as the driving force thank you very much Thank you so much, Mr. Demarco, for elucidating so well that the holy cow was never about religion. It was often and always about politics. The holiness of the cow is a myth, and its flesh actually played an important part in the cuisine of ancient India. Various religious scripts have underlined the fact that beef eating was not introduced as a part of Islamic culture. but has been part of india since ancient times also how it was used during the revolt of 1857 to encourage indian sepoys to take up arms or revolt against the british commanders by talking about the cow and pig fat used at the cartridges further on you spoke about how british understanding and various ambedkar writings also mm-hmm. highlighted the division between those who eat cows and those who worship cows and how this division grew over the period of time how dayanand saraswati and gandhi used cow politics for the indian national movement it was all very well pointed out and in recently more recently how the cow vigilante groups have lynched people to death in the name of protecting cow the absurd claims more recently around the covid times about the benefits of the cow dung and cow urine and how it's bottled and sold in various uh, outlets in india and how morality police actually used this advisory to on which falls on valentine's day to actually hug cows to celebrate or um, mark 14th they didn't use the word valentine's day but it was clearly a suggestion to replace valentine's day 
with hugging of cows and celebrating um, the importance of cow. And the logic was that hugging cow will bring emotional richness and increase individual and collective happiness. What I believe is that hugging a cow can be dangerous and can land you in hospitals also. But as you said, the withdrawal of this advisory quickly by the government-run animal husbandry board is a victory. And I'm glad common sense prevailed over zealous people trying to please uh, certain groups of the government by such advisories. So thank you so much. Now we invite questions. I request you to raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can ask your questions. But before you ask your question, I'll request all of you to please introduce yourself briefly and then ask questions. Okay, you can do it virtually or physically. Um, but let's start with, yes. I am Chandra Hasa from Bangalore. I am a, a member of a rationalist uh, group. And also we have uh, internally here in India also some uh, uh, within the Karnataka state also some rationalist uh, group is there in the local language. And first of all, I thank uh, Mr. Sanal for uh, reintroducing this Zoom meeting because we are very comfortable with the Zoom meeting and suddenly it, was, it disappeared for some time. And uh, we don't find that comfort in the clubhouse. Here at least we can see you and your speech. We can uh, uh, the, we can grasp directly from Zoom meeting rather than from the clubhouse. Yeah, coming back to the today's subject. Yes, this cow hug, as, as you correctly said, it has been uh, uh, there was a lot of criticism and it has been already withdrawn and there is a. Uh, Absolutely, it, it, it has become a ridiculous uh, affair. Uh, you, regarding one or two points, uh, what you have mentioned, I would like to say one thing. In Vedic times, yes, there was, uh, uh, the, I mean, cow slaughter and uh, sacrifices and uh, also people who are eating, they were, uh, they were non-vegetarians in all uh, probability. But uh, I understand... Uh, that is uh, uh, during the introduction of Buddhism and who are very tolerant uh, to the atrocities and uh, so many things. They were supporting, they were kind to the animal and they were uh, not believing in these uh, the, a lot of rituals and Vedic uh, traditions. So, from that point, I understand because that is what I, I uh, understand that one group started practicing vegetarianism in Buddhism and which was later hijacked by this uh, Hinduism. So, they, till then they were practicing these uh, sacrifices and they were uh, non-vegetarians. Seeing Buddhism who are uh, very kind to the animal, they shifted. That is what I heard. But you said only after Dayananda Saraswati introduced then these people became vegetarian. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I want you to clarify. Second point, uh, on the cow slaughter, uh, you see, even though it is banned in a few of the states where, uh, the, where is one political party is ruled, but uh, the unfortunate thing is the highest export of beef is taking. India has the first rank in the export of beef. The third point is, after introducing this uh, the cow slaughter, people cannot kill. The, uh, generally, what used to happen, the farmer, after the use of the cows, uh, the, this one, when, they, when it becomes useless, they used to sell to a the, the slaughterhouse and they get some money. So, uh, their uh, life goes on like this. But what happened when there is a ban they cannot sell the cows and they cannot maintain the cow also because uh, each cow, I understand, they have to spend about 100 rupees per day and a poor farmer definitely cannot. As a result, what has happened? These cows started wandering throughout the, the place. They go to and they don't have anything to eat. They go to the, the farmer's field and try to eat there and they run around. And they have become like a skeleton-like uh, uh, creatures and die on the road in a miserable condition. 
because uh, we are animal lovers eh? but uh, the condition under which they die it is a very very uh, pitiable added to that uh, now uh, the, the government also uh, introduced uh, goshalas goshala means the cow can be uh, the brought to a common place and you should maintain it and government has given lot of grants also in some places it is working well but in most of the goshalas their treatment are very very horrible i today i read in some papers also they cannot even give the food so even they, they take the grant and probably not utilizing so in the in total what has happened by this ban it has become counterproductive i mean these are the few points i wanted to share but my main intention is i want to understand clearly when this vegetarianism is uh, uh, the adopted by uh, the hindus is it uh, uh, when the buddhism came into being or is it uh, very late uh, like dayananda saraswati's time thank you thank you very much uh, uh, chandrahasa see glad seeing you after a long time now uh, number one i think uh, maybe what i said was misunderstood i didn't say that vegetarianism or the the predominance of eating plant based food started with the ananda saraswati the ananda saraswati this time was when the predominance of cow worship or focusing cow as a point of worship as two points one as a rallying point of hindus at one side on the other side a rallying point against the muslims because he was trying to convince muslims to reconvert to hinduism so he has taken cow worship as a major point of his political position vegetarianism historically we have records of um, travelers written in second century and third century mentioning that majority of the indians are eating vegetable based food and very few people are only going for meat based food second third century it's mentioned there which means there is an importance of eating the grains and eating dairy was uh, existing something like second third century was very very clear it existed there but still meat eating was coexisting but whether it is totally because of buddhism that's one argument which many people would say even i partially think that it could have a great influence but on the other side the later documentation of ashoka's emperor ashoka's uh, uh, diet menu in their palace it shows you know earlier they were mainly slaughtering peacocks and deers for the food of the people in the palace and they had something like 300 deers and approximately 300 peacocks were slaughtered every day there for the people in the the high echelons of the army as well as the people in the royalty and all the huge empire's capital but when ashoka became a follower of buddhism there is an official declaration that the number of animals to be killed should be reduced it has come from 300 600 etc etc to 20 to 50 it was not slaughtered abundantly but for the most necessary purpose only and also i mean one of the major uh, stories about the death of buddha for example gautama the buddha um, as even mentioned by ambedkar i mean quoting some old traditions was because of eating of uh, pork offered by one of his disciples and there was indigestion because it was either bad food or there is a food poisoning i mean having said that that doesn't mean that buddhists were totally asking for abstinence from meat eating but they insisted on on killing animals only for eating not for the sacrifice but that was also a tradition which the charvakas were insisting if you can see the quotes from the charvakas which were coming in other texts they were telling that don't kill these animals for giving to gods so one of the major example on evidences coming from the upanishads is because literature of charvakas are not available only quotes from charvakas are available because they were answered by in other upanishads it says that the charvakas so are so bad people so immoral people because they ask such stupid questions like if the sacrificial animal would go to the heaven straightly why don't they sacrifice their beloved ones the father and mother 
because going to heaven is one of the best things according to their belief. So, in fact, that's a question which points out also to the questioning of the Charvakas against the sacrificing of animals. You see in all uh, later literature that there were a huge number of animals just were sacrificed. Like in Bakri, the Muslims would do. Most of the animals are just killed only. So, mainly the major contribution of the Charvakas, Kanadas, Lokayadas and all these people apparently could be, again, on this point, could be against the sacrifice of animals, not the, I mean, instead the idea of killing animals for food only, not for sacrificing was perhaps point. Perhaps that was the point which apparently Ashoka took as an emperor to reduce the number of animals, the bare minimum of animals that is required. And that was the tradition perhaps the Buddhists were following. And also many streams of Buddhism still, even in Thailand, eat meat. They eat meat, but they would try to their major food is coming from vegetable-based food. So it, it doesn't mean that, I mean, Buddhism could be the only influence. It can have certainly an influence because we don't have any clear evidences than what is available in other literature that mentions things. Buddhism could be an influence, but also one would see that in places where Buddhism got predominant influence, like in Japan or in China, people did not become vegetarians. Japan is a major consumer of meat and Chinese also. They eat a lot of, and all in Southeast Asia where Buddhism became very prevalent, there also they eat meat. But the idea of, that has been contributed by Buddhism was to kill animals only for your personal consumption, not for sacrifice. And in that case also, that's a very important point. The sacrifices are absurd and baseless, we all know. And if that is a contribution of Buddhism or the Charvakas or the Kanatas, or ancient Indian free thinkers and rationalists, well, that is also an important point. Thank you, Chandrahasa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chandrahasa. Now, I invite uh, Ratish to uh, ask his question, please. Good evening. Uh, hi, sir. So, the, the current situation in India, I think uh, cow is more powerful than man. Cow is a political animal. Anytime cow can change the political situation here. Just a topic on cow. So last two, three days, all uh, social media, news channel, everything is following. I don't think it's a very, very uh, huge topic or it's just a huge uh, news value. But still, it's all everybody. There's a huge scope of toll and uh, satiring and fun making in that. So the last few weeks in India, there was a documentary, a BBC documentary, Adani issues, and so much of uh, issues here. So, because just a cow topic came, everything vanished from the even the social media, news media, everything. Don't you think there is something, it's a plant or it's just a, what do you call it, uh, just a blunder from someone or a plan move from someone else? Yes, I am confused. What is your take on this? Uh, uh, fine, Ritish, I mean, uh, there could be apparently an over-enthusiastic person and also these kind of things and how it, it works in politics is very well clear. I mean, sometimes you wanted to bring, try the testing ground of some kind of a position and how the public reaction is watched and then to what extent it, you know, how, what kind of public response it would create is watched and then policies are formulated accordingly. This was not officially coming from government of India, not from the cabinet, not from anybody from the ministry but it was coming from the animal husbandry department. It was not part of his job at all. This was not at all his official responsibility. But the testing, if it was a testing ground, how it would be treated, and the Indian population and the world media and Indian social media especially has reacted so well and they understood what would be the response to such a move. And that was a very big success. On the other side, it could be, may not be a plan by anybody, but just an over-enthusiastic person, like a, like a cow vigilant, now a cow, like a cow worshipper, who think that must be this would be the best thing that I could do when I have a position, and pro probably this will be appreciated, probably he thought. And then the political authorities found, oh, come on, what this guy is doing? And they asked him, come on, take it away. That I mean, we cannot say what happened. But at the end of the day, that it is taken away so fast as it came, when the protest started yesterday, we initiated it anyway, and uh, immediately we see that uh, 
the social media has taken it up and it has been going everywhere and by the time it became evening it's withdrawn that's a big success in any case but what was behind it is something that the opposition is now asking in india but that's something we have to wait and see to get more information thank you very much ratish thank you now i invite uh, ms kunjama to speak oh, okay thank you very much good evening um sanal sir i am very happy that you brought this uh, subject today because last uh, three four days i was responding to all the post coming in malayalam you know they are joking about this how cow hug day so uh, this is so fruitful people are uh, around india rejected this uh, cow hug day and it uh, government of india I, I, i don't know who is who took it up central government or uh, local government they stopped that cow cow hug day it is very appreciated very much appreciated you know in my home ch- from childhood onwards we have cows hogs and bulls in the barn uh, they all there but the uh, milking cow was always protected they have a, a cubic in the barn so they were separated so and also uh, in my family my parents everybody was soft on cow because cow's behavior is very calm comparatively to bull and ox and ox and ox and ox and both you know so m- mom and grandma always uh, told us um, be kind with the cow and feed them more you know like hey whatever we are feeding them and they are um, the cow feed now it is sub- subsidized through panchayat and uh, they are well fed comparatively the ox and bull even if the ox and bulls are not fed they will take cows food also they cross the border so i was so, so happy to see this and uh, i think the before uh, in india i don't know i may be wrong um, people started uh, uh, worshiping cow this was started in egyptian culture like uh, worshiping cow and snake then it is came to india i think this is what i don't have any evidence to show you maybe dr uh, sanal sir knows this if you would say about that i would be my confusion would be cleared then another thing india is still exporting so much beef you know it come to america also so much beef and this beef exporters are mostly hindus i don't know uh, how can they say cow is holy and protected not to kill and the other hand they are exporting huge huge amount of beef and it is very much profitable i don't know why people don't see that i have no objection whatever india export i am very happy and i want india export every item they can i am i i i, I have no problem with that and i have no problem with anybody worshiping cobra anybody worshiping cow or elephant whatever they want to worship i i am not against to it uh, i believe in plural plural secular secularism that's what i believe so thank you very much for this time let me talk uh, thank you sir yeah thank you very much and uh, what i feel is uh, yeah one major thing is that whether it was practiced in other cultures there are a lot of evidences that in egyptian culture and even in mesopotamian culture you can see animals were worshiped but that was part of the whole global historic tradition wherever ancient cultures were there in mesopotamia in phoenicia in uh, egypt everywhere you see animals were worshiped so but that was one stage but animals being worshiped is something and loving animals is some other thing that's totally different also as somebody i think ritish or uh, chandra has rightly said earlier i couldn't answer that i i couldn't at that time but the the kind of cows or animals that are killed in india for food they are not healthy cows in fact they are pretty old ones you know instead of mechanizing the farm sector we are still depending cows for energy for plowing and for cleaning the harvesting and everything we are using cows so what is required is you know the whole idea that a cow has to work for us as a slave all the time and when it is weak when it is tired it slaughtered and given us food for people has two problems number one we don't get good meat number one number two i mean an old cow 
which is working all its years. I mean, it's not even treated well. I mean, it's, but on the other side, killing any animal is in a way, it's, it's a sad thing. But uh, I mean, life cycle is like that. I mean, most of the animals would survive uh, with the meat of other creatures only. I mean, that's how the, the food cycle goes. But in any case, if you grow animals to slaughter, they should be slaughtered at a certain age. Otherwise, it's economically not wise because you are feeding food for that animal for a long time and its growth is stopped at certain time. And then it's not for the growing. Number two, using animals for plowing and, I mean, or, or getting their work is not a, a very sustainable way of handling it. If you consider the kind of food you give to this animal and the kind of work you try to do and the kind of productivity that you achieve, I mean, there is no balance. There is no productivity as compared to what machines can do. We have to mechanize. India is a farming country with 80% of the land is used for farming and 60% of the population still farmers and small scale farmers. We have to mechanize Indian farms and leave these bulls out of this farmland. And if we should produce only what is required, we should not produce. India has the globe's largest number of cattle. We don't need all these cattle. Only the required number of cattle are to be produced. And if we want to slaughter them, we should slaughter them at the right age, not when they become very, very old and weak and they cannot work anymore. And milking cows are to be promoted and if people want to consume dairy products, but what is required only? Over the overpopulation of animals sometimes is not for the quality of these animals also. If there are more animals, we cannot look after them. I can tell one small example in Finland. I mean, it's comparable. In Finland, people eat reindeer. There is reindeer and it's abundantly available, but you cannot have more reindeers than the nature can sustain. Reindeer needs a certain kind of food coming from the algae and mouse. But if you have more reindeers, they will be starving. They will have a bad life. So therefore, you have to cull them. So you are, people are allowed to slaughter reindeers, but the number is controlled because we as humans, we have understanding about what is balanceable, what is sustainable, and what we have to control accordingly. I would suggest that, I mean, we should think of a sustainable way of consuming meal and only what is required we should we should grow and don't allow animals to suffer. On the other side, I mean, another friend has pointed out a very important point. I think Ritish has pointed out that the way our cattle are handled in India, we worship cows and the cows are suffering. Most of them are wandering in the street. And if you see what the cows are eating in the urban cities, most of them are eating the wastage from the dustbins. And Many of them are suffocating with plastic inside their stomach. And so many cows really, really suffering with the entrapped plastic in their stomach. I mean, it's a very serious problem of the health of the cows. So if we love any animal, one should treat them well. If you want to eat, produce only what we want. And don't try to extract slavery from these animals, but rather, since we are a developed world now, and we should go for mechanized way of handling our farms, making the production more uh, easy and reducing the workload that people have and grow only what we require and more considerate approach to these animals, not allow them to suffer much. Even slaughtering, I mean, if you want to slaughter, should be with less pain and uh, kindness should be I mean, applied to the extent it's possible. Thank you. Yes, um, nice to see you all. Nice to see you, Zanal, and your daughter. We met in Vijayawada last month. That was very, a very enjoyable experience to see the beautiful country. I'm sorry if I'm coughing so much. But uh, when I heard the news that there was going to be a Hug Your Cow Day, I was laughing. <laughs> Because how do you do that? You just go up to some cow on the street and you just grab them with your arms. And <laughs> um, but, uh, but I do have a question for anybody. You mentioned this, there's cow worship. And in my mind, the word for 
worship um, is not just to adore something uh, and to love it, but usually worship involves some kinds of sacrifice or ritual or action. And so, I, forgive me, I'm very ignorant about the, the cow worship, but it, does cow worship involve actually bringing gifts to a cow or anything that, that you might resemble a religious ritual, or is it just is it just a feeling of respect? W w how would you describe the word worship when it comes to a cow as opposed to like, I don't know, some king? Uh, you can worship a king. You can go bow down and kiss its feet and stuff, or you can worship a god. So maybe you could clarify that a little bit for me. Uh, Dan, it's very interesting how people are worshipping cows in India. Many people, cows who are you know, brought to houses sometimes in many of the uh, many parts of India, cows are you know decorated cows are brought to houses, and then you touch the cow and you pray to the cow and you you fold your hands in front of the cow and request for benefits to be bestowed upon you. All these kind of things like a normal prayer that people will do. Then of course. Since it's an animal, you would feed some food, human food to cows, not men food meant for cows, but for example, rice or, I mean, we call chapati, a wheat pancake. All these kinds of things are fed to the cow and cows are celebrated. And on other parts, cows are, you know, the icons of cows are made or statues of cows are made and that's worshipped in many places. And more, and more than that, cow is something holy. That's the general feeling. People think that Everything from cow is holy and it can cure you. For example, cow's urine. If you drink cow's urine, you are going to be protected from corona. And that is widely propagated. And people, you can see on the internet people just going back of the cow when it urinates and drink directly in your hand. Or cow urine is sold in medical, uh, medical stores, Ayurvedic medical shops, as a holy material that can cure you. Also, the mixture of five things from cow cow dung, cow urine, cow milk and all these kind of things blended together is eaten by people because it's a holy animal and that's going to serve you. And also now there is a new campaign that to get your skin glowing and beautiful, you have to use cow dung and cow urine and everything smeared on your face and then the cows will bless you and you become very beautiful. All these kind of upset ideas are, I mean, spread everywhere and that's taken. And if anybody criticizes the cow, or touch a cow or attack a cow, they are attacked. That's the more thing. It's more negative also. And if anybody denounce a cow or if anybody eat a cow, then you can be killed in India. I cannot say that I like a good steak in India. It can be dangerous. Thank you very much. I appreciate the medical advice. I was going to go drink some cow urine, maybe to make myself get better. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, you, you know, I suppose there's one advantage to cow urine. And if, if you're dying of thirst in the desert, I suppose that liquid would keep you alive, you know. But other than that, I don't know. Um, so, um, so you say they give gifts to cows, but there are hundreds of thousands of cows. Do you, do you just pick one of them and then they all get the benefit? Or does every single cow in the entire state have to get this gift i remember when we were in um uttar pradesh it was a month ago and driving in in uh, india i have to say something most people in india are very polite people except when they're driving <laughs> <laughs> they, they are not they are so aggressive when they are driving but uh there was a big black steer cow in the middle of this road there's a crowded road in, uh, I don't know, I think it was in Lucknow or somewhere up there, <clears throat> or maybe a Gorakhpur. And um, there was all these motorcycles and buses and cars and autos and, and pedestrians, but everybody was just very polite to the cow. The cow was just wandering in the middle of this road, causing a real traffic hazard, you know, and it, it, you, 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 we had to stop and wait for this cow to move. So it, it, is that because there was such a respect for cows that they just let them wander everywhere? One, one thing is, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting point that you've said that cows are everywhere. There are a lot of cows and uh, in streets you can see cow and uh, people are afraid to touch a cow. 
not because they worship only but because if you touch a cow if you scare a cow an angry cow worshiper can come and attack you and if you hit a cow then i mean more than the person in the car the you will be attacked because you have you touched a cow on the other side cows are treated very badly as you rightly say i mean we can see a lot of cows in the streets of all urban cities wandering for food and many people who have a cow they would just let them off thinking that cow is a worshiped animal and people would give feed but it also feeds on city garbage in most of the places and that's a sad situation that cows at one side they are treated on the other side they are mistreated and uh, as animals who are um, tamed animals i mean they cannot be treated like that i mean by i mean uh, forcing them to getting fed on on the garbage with plastic and and the most of the cows are dying with suffocation with the entrapped uh, plastic in their stomach in all urban cities in india but pro- theoretically all cows are worshiped every single cow is worshiped but in practice only those cows that are brought to you decorated is given the offerings thank you dad dad uh, sharing your experiences in gorakhpur and uttar pradesh also thank you dad so much thank you <laughs> Thank you it was wonderful to hear from you Dan. Uh thank you all for joining from across the world for today's discussion. And uh, we'll be sending you further updates um uh, about our future meetings. It's mostly on weekends on Saturday and Sunday evenings, one done in Malayalam and another one done in English. All the latest news and events across the world will be discussed and we invite all of you to join those meetings. Thank you all once again. Thank you very much and we are restarting this uh... new structure of zoom along with other other methods that we try to use also like uh, we would be making youtube live clubhouse meetings as well as zoom meetings to reach out friends as much as possible tell your friends and let's have more wider participation in the next meeting thank you very much